Again, we're in 1 Corinthians. I bet you didn't know that. 1 Corinthians, we're in chapter 7 of, or chapter 4, verse 7. We did 6 last week. We're in 4 to 9, 7 this week. And uh, we're going to learn some things here. This is the, if you ever wanted to put a title on this chapter, it would be the Ministry of the Apostles. And, uh, here we have in verse 7, when you find it, stand. We honor God's word by standing. Some people say it's just a book. It's more than just a book. It's God's word. 
1 Corinthians 4, 7. It's more, it's, and God says he, he lifts up his word above his own name. So that means a lot. It should mean a lot to us because of it. And so uh, let's look at verse 7. One verse, and then we'll pray. We can sit down then. For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Now if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hast not received it? Seems like a tongue twister, but it's really easily to explain. Uh, we're probably not going to get to the whole thing. We're probably just going to get to point one, not point one, two, and three. So we'll probably just get point one. I'm just telling you. There's a lot to look at, but let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, Lord. And we'll give you praise. God, I pray that you meet with us. Holy Ghost, we just ask that you make your presence known. And God, I pray, stir us up in our hearts. I need a stirring in my heart. I need the fire to be kindled. And the Holy Ghost have his way. Forgive us, Lord, of our wicked ways, our sin. Forgive us of this old flesh that has its way during the day. And God will give you praise for it in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. You can be seated. There's three points here. That's in this verse. And it's real simple, and the preachers love things like this. It says, For who maketh thee to differ from another? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? And now if thou didst receive it, why doth thou glory as if thou did had not received it? Three points. Who make who makes thee? Who made all the all creation? That's what he's saying. Who made it all? Asking you a question. He wants you to answer it to yourself. And, and this is a good point. When you read this verse, when he says who says, who maketh thee, that's when you start looking it up. I'm going to prove who made me. Mm -hmm. And the second point is, and what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Huh? What do you have that hasn't been given to you by God? Everything you have has been given to you by God. What do you have? Name something and glory in it yourself then. Hmm? But see, all we have is given to us by God. The third point is, why dost thou glory as if thou had not received it? Why do you glory as if God didn't give it to you? That maybe it was some accomplishment you got in life. Just like when I played football. Played football those years, and guys would glory over things that they did on the field when in reality that God didn't give them the talent, if God didn't give them the opportunity, if God didn't put them on a team, if God did not give them their health, well, these guys would have never been able to play football. Huh? I told you the time that we were playing a game. <laughs> and uh, I forget what the score was at the time. It was like 12 to nothing. We're losing. And I intercepted the ball. And I'm running the ball, and all of a sudden, everybody starts screaming on the field. All the players are saying, the play's been blown dead. The play's blown dead. So I stopped, and so did everybody out. The referee comes over to me and says, I didn't blow a whistle. You know what the, he was telling me? It's not dead. And I took off. I took an opportunity. You know who gave me that referee to tell me that? Huh? Oh, well, it was an accident. It was chance, it's happenstance. No, it was God who told me through that referee, keep going. And so I took off, scored a touchdown, the only score we had in the game. <laughs> huh? And it had, had to come off of something fluke like that. Yeah. I'm just telling you. I'm just telling you, that's, just, that's, just, that's simple. But see, you've got a lot in your life that God has given you. And you start out with your salvation. And Him giving you repentance or granting repentance to you so you can receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen. I mean, He was looking out after you. Amen. See? And he gave you salvation in Jesus Christ. So much so he's looking out after you. Before you were even born, he made a plan. And before the world was founded, he made a plan. Look at He had written this all in heaven before he even created the foundations of the world. Amen. He was looking out after you. Amen. He got his eye on you. He said he's willing that none should perish. Huh? He wants us all to come to repentance. Amen. 
Now, did you hear that? Let me, let me take that back to that. All come to repentance. Yeah. Know what he's saying? You must repent to be saved. Right. That's what he said. These people, no matter what they say, by the way, when you bring that verse up, they don't know what to do with it. They know that verse, but they didn't realize it ended in repentance. When you bring it up, they're like, oh, oh, oh. And then they always take you back to their standards. Where that's work salvation. No Bible verses. That's work salvation. No, it ain't. If it's work salvation, God's telling us we have to work our way into heaven then. <laughs> but repentance isn't a work salvation. The Bible says God grants it to us. We can't, we can't conjure it up. We're not sorcerers of repentance. We're not wizards of repentance. We're not magicians that can conjure up repentance in our heart so that we can get saved. No, it's God. He gives it to us. And he does it by convicting us in our conscience, in our souls, that we are in sin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. People don't get that. I've been preaching 40 years now this year, coming year, and I'm just telling you, I'm amazed at how it's changed. I posted this on our site. I posted this. Preachers, don't give up to the soft-minded and weak doctrine preachers, Christians, and world. Amen. Keep preaching them. Don't let them change your preaching. Because that's what they're trying to do. They're hammering me all the time. Right. Change your preaching. Change your... I had a lady today. Said, you need to change your preaching. You need to be all love. Uh -oh. <laughs> I started going, you know what? There's a time that God tells us. But Bible, look at it. Let me tell you what preaching is supposed to be. Repro reproof, rebuke, and exhortation. Ooh, Repu reproof. reproof and rebuke are two negatives. She said, no negatives. I actually read her site. And she says, I, I, have, I had ladies who were negative towards me, so I'm, I determined I'm never going to be negative anymore. I'm not going to always say positive and no negative. Well, you got a dead battery, I'm just telling you, because a battery has a negative side. Every cell has negatives. I'm talking about cells in your body. Huh? Atoms have negatives in them. They wouldn't have been able to make the atomic bomb. You've got to have negatives if you're going to become something. Huh? Abraham Lincoln had more negatives in his life than he had positives. He was a failure in a whole lot of things, and people uh, treated him horribly. Uh, he was treated uh, like he was, he was a, like a second class. He was an ed uneducated man. Do you know that? Abraham Lincoln only had one year of school. He said the two books he read that got him anywhere was the Bible and Pilgrim's Progress. Huh? Pilgrim's Progress written by John Bunyan about the Bible. Huh? And those are the books he read. He had one year of public education. But he became a lawyer. He became a, a congressman. He became... President. <laughs> huh, isn't that funny? D.L. Moody preached, turned two continents upside down for the cause of Christ, had a sixth grade education. Huh? They said that he could say Mephibosheth in one syllable. <laughs> it's a five syllable word, you know. <laughs> but he could say it in one syllable. But he won more people to the Lord and was used of God because God's not interested in your education. <clears throat> hmm? He's interested in your faithfulness. He can make you what he wants you to be. God has all the power. He's, he it says right here, that's our first point. Who maketh thee to differ from another? God does. He makes you to differ from somebody else. Look, if you look around at each one of each other, we look different. Okay? I got, I got white privilege. You guys don't. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Can't you tell I have white privilege? <laughs> If I got white privilege, I want to know where I've been keeping it. <laughs> I want to know where it's at. <laughs> huh? I'll tell you who's got white privilege, AOC, and she's not even white. <laughs> Kamala Harris. Huh? They got white privilege. Hmm? They called that, that woman who won the lieutenant governor's office in Virginia, who happens to be Jamaican, she's black. She's a refugee who became a citizen. And she was in the Marines, and she's a Republican, conservative Republican, and her name's Winsome, and they said that she got into office because she's got white privilege. <laughs> Are they nuts? You know what? She's different. 
That's our, that's our problem. See? We're all different. God made us all different. From, the, from our looks, from our hearts internally, from, from our character, integrity. Huh? God's given us talents. He's done all kinds of things for us. Huh? And some of them, we don't recognize that he's given it to us. He's made you something and making you something. Let me, let me give you an illustration. I, and I have to use this illustration here before, but maybe you don't remember. Maybe you do. But just listen anyway. Well, there was this guy. He, he worked for the king. And he would go down to the, every day, go down to the river and get water in the water jugs. And he'd come back. And when he'd get back, there was one water jug that was always empty. Another one was full. But he always used the two same water jugs, and he'd go down, and he'd get the water and come back, and one was empty and one was full. He did this day after day after day. Well, one day, the water jug that always ended up empty started crying to the servant, saying, I'm no good for the, for the master. He says, by the time I get back to the castle, I'm empty. I have nothing to offer the, the, the master. And the servant looks back, and he says, do you notice this pathway we walk every day? They say, yeah, it's really beautiful. Look at all the flowers and the plants and everything. They're really nice, really green. The flowers are really beautiful. They're vibrant. He says, yeah. He says, if you didn't leak that water out every day, those plants wouldn't get any water. He says, see, you're making the pathway beautiful. See, you're serving in a manner that no one else is serving. See, God makes you what he wants to make you. And it's, it may not be what we want to be. Huh? We may, we may feel like we're fractured and we're, we're, we're no good or we, we can't do things that others do. But God says, I'm doing something with you. I'm doing something. Look over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm glad you asked about this chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 for Brother Dave's sake. Amen. Amen. Verse 4 says, Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. What's that diversity of gifts mean? It means everybody has different gifts. But it comes through one way. The same Spirit. Huh? Isn't that kind of funny? The, the Holy Ghost, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness. That's nine fruit of the Spirit. You can have nine different fruit of the Spirit and yet one Spirit. You can, have, you can have all these gifts that God can give you. Not just the fruit of the Spirit, but I'm talking other gifts. The Bible says there's gifts of administration, gifts of teaching, and, but they all come through the same Spirit. Say. One person may be a real good teacher, and another guy may be real good at administrating. You know what administrating is? You're very, you're very, like your mom, organized. I mean, you go into her house, she'll say, my, sorry, my house is dirty. You know what she means? I got a, I got a spoon in the sink. <laughs> I'm like, I wish our house was so dirty. <laughs> huh? Amen, you got ten kids in the house, you have more than one spoon in the sink. You have a pile of dishes in the sink. <laughs> huh? Good thing we have a regimented washing the dishes uh, routine. Huh? But administrating. See, that's a gift. Not everybody can be uh, neat, Amen. organized. Look at my office. You go to my office, you're going to go. <laughs> you're closing the door as fast as you can so nothing jumps out of it. <laughs> Everything stays in there. I got Fibber McGee's closet. Some of you guys don't even know who Fibber McGee is. So <laughs> that's a wasted point. <laughs> huh? Fibber McGee, his closet, if you opened the door, everything fell out. Huh? And he had to he had to push everything back in and close the door real fast. That's the way my office is. <laughs> huh? I'm not an organizer. I'm not. Huh? I figure I figure if there's a box and you can throw something that's not full, I can throw it in there. That's organized. Organized as I'm getting. I don't have administrative skills. It takes me a lot to be uh, have those kind of skills. But you can have other skills, like preaching. Not everybody can be a preacher. Stand behind a pulpit and preach. Huh? There are people who get up here, they, they'd, be, they'd be messed up. It may ruin them for life. <laughs> huh? It's because it's not, their, it's not a gift that they got. But God, it still all comes through the same spirit. See? God is the one who makes us who we are. Hmm? 30, 40 years ago, I would have never thought of being in preaching like I do now. 
knowing the things I do know and being able to speak before people. Look, at I was, I was what they called an introvert. You know what an introvert is? I didn't say nothing to nobody. If you, you had to get me mad if I was going to say anything to anybody. I'm not joking. Get me mad and you can get all kinds of words out of my mouth. You wouldn't like any of them, but they come out of my mouth. <laughs> I was very introvert. So when God called me to preach, I argued with him for a year. No, you got the wrong person. Why? He would ask. And I'd say, because I can't speak. Remember when I was running for office? They talked me into it in eighth grade, running for office in the school. And I sat there, umming and umming and umming. And that's all I said. That was my whole speech. I think it was titled, Um. <laughs> um I, totally, I literally was like this. Um, 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 you know how I finished my, my message? Not um. No, it's vote for me. <laughs> one of my friends, of all people, one of my friends comes, I'm voting for you. I said, I'm not even voting for me. <laughs> Are you kidding? <laughs> I said, I don't like me. I'm a horrible speaker. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Amen. So I'm just telling you, bro. I said, when God told me that you were going to preach, I'm like, no way. He said, who made your mouth? Who made your tongue? Remember Moses? He did the same thing. Made all kinds of excuses. And I was able to use him. That's what convinced me, by the way. And I surrendered to preach. Hmm? And then immediately, he loosed my tongue. Next thing I know, I was like, I was like a rambling rose. I was all over the place. Telling everybody about God. Telling them about Jesus. Huh? Changed me. Hmm? Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 10. Who makes you? Who makes you? Huh? <laughs> Who makes you different than uh, uh, one another? Hmm? That's why, look at when you become critical of somebody, it's usually because you're examining them according to how you are. Now listen to me. This is, this is, good. This is some wisdom. This is going to help you. You will examine them the way you are. And if God makes everyone different, then why are you examine them according to how God made you? See, why? Why would you do that? No wonder God says, don't esteem yourself better than others. He says, he, says, he that compares himself with himself is not wise. God's made us different. He's just telling you right here in 1 Corinthians 4, 7. You're different. Look at 15 of 1 Corinthians, verse 10. It says, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. That's what Paul's saying. How did he get what he is? By the grace of God. And he says, and his grace which bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than ye, they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was in me. Look at, you know what he's saying? He's saying, I am not taking credit at all for what God's made me. And I may labor harder than you, but it's not because of me. It's because of God and His grace. He's given me the ability by the grace of God. Remember when he had a thorn in the flesh? And God says, my grace is sufficient for thee? Huh? How is he able to endure that and overcome? It's by the grace of God. He said, I'd rather be strong in the grace, in my weakness. See, and that's what he's telling us. By the grace of God, I'll be strong. Hmm? And that's who makes you. God makes you that way. Look over at Romans chapter 9. Back up a book. Romans chapter 9. Verse 16. I'm just trying to lay some things out here for you. I know you know God made you. If someone come up to you and said, hey, can you show me that God made me and what God's made you and, and, and how he's made you? Or can you tell me what he's doing in you? Huh? Can you tell me about the grace of God? What did it do for Paul? Romans chapter 9, verse 16. It says this, So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. You see that? It's not the guy who, who wills things. It's not the guy who runs. Huh? Who is it? It's God that shows mercy. That's who's important. That's who's got it to control. That's who's making you. 
Your boss doesn't make you. You don't make yourself. You're not a self-made man or woman. Look at people say, well, you just need to pull up your bootstraps and quit you like men. That's true. But the thing is, it's not going to make you anything of you unless you got God and His grace and mercy. You're going to be useless. I mean, look at any man can pull up his bootstraps. Any man can stand up and go to work. But can anybody do it in grace and mercy of God? Not, not very, very few can. Very few can. Look at verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on, in whom he will he hardeneth. And what did God do? God hardened the heart of Pharaoh. Pharaoh couldn't help it. He said, well, he's got a free will. God wanted to show his hand powerful, mighty. Go figure that God would harden his heart. Let's read that again. You say, well, I don't believe God hardened his heart. What did it say? Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. The Bible says that he hardened Pharaoh's heart, that after he let the people go, he sent his soldiers, he sent his, his chariots after those Israelites to recapture them and bring them on back. And because his heart was hardened, look, at, I'm going to tell you something about pride, and that, that's why his heart was hardened with pride. Pride will blind you. He didn't realize the danger he was in with God. Wait, he just saw ten plagues. He just saw his own son die. All the firstborn of, the, of Egypt die, even the firstborn of animals. He saw the Israelites survived. Why? Because they painted the doorposts and the lentils with the blood of the lamb, picturing Christ. And God spared anyone who did that to their house. And if they were inside, in their shoes, in their jackets, eating the lamb, with, fully cooked with bitter herbs, and anything that was left, they were to burn it till it turned charcoal. <laughs> huh? I'm just telling you, he saw all that, and yet his heart got hardened, and he went after the God of Israel. Now, if God can kill his own fam uh, Pharaoh's family, if he can kill all the firstborn of Egypt, if he can bring flies and turn the water into blood, hey, and if he can turn a, a, a rod into a snake and swallow up his, his uh, soothsayers and his magicians' snakes, wouldn't he seem to fear God? But he didn't. And they were destroyed. The Egyptians today are on the bottom of the Red Sea. Hmm? They got pictures of the chariots still on the bottom of the Red Sea. Hmm. Yeah, it happened. And how come? Because God can do what he wants. Amen. Who maketh thee? Huh? God made the situation perfect for what he needed. He showed God's hand mighty. You want to know what happened when that happened? Where they destroyed all Egypt? Egypt was the most powerful army on the face of the earth. And Israel wins. Check this out. The next foe, the next foe they come to is Jericho. Guess what Jericho was doing? Shaking in their boots because of the victories that Israel had. They were afraid. Huh. Ephesians chapter 3. Turn over there. Verse 3. It says this. How that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery. Who made known unto me the mystery? God did, as I wrote before in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. God hid it from men. Huh? As it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. See that Spirit? Revealed the truth, the mystery of Christ, to the prophets and the people of God. Huh? The apostles and the prophets. I'm telling you, it was God who made them know this. You know, when you read your Bible, you only understand what you read because of God. It's not because of you. Look, it's not because you're so smart. It's not because you're, you, I got this wisdom, I got it all under control. That got to strip you of that wisdom if he wants to. Huh? 
he just take it away from you. He'll take, he'll close your eyes. He'll close your ears. Huh? He'll, he'll silence the spirit in you. He'll put out the fire. You said he wouldn't do that. I've seen it happen to many of Christians. Where they were on fire for God, and because they, they mocked the Lord, because they thought it was them, they were somebody without God. And God said, okay, I'll let you prove it. Became most miserable. Hmm? Became most miserable. I don't want to be there. I like, I like it when the Lord speaks to me. I like it when he, when he shows me things, and I know it's him showing it to me. Hmm? And acknowledge it to him. Remember when I came down here to pastor? What did I tell you? I said what happened was, is I was praying in my office. I always prayed at least two hours in the morning in my office. And I'd, I'd be praying, and the Lord starts speaking to me about something. And he says, have you ever thought about, exactly like this, he said, have you ever thought about going back into pastoring? Because I pastored before. And I'm in my office, I'm running Reclamation Ranch. And uh, I said, nah, that got to be in my head. <laughs> no way is God going to ask me to do that again. <laughs> hmm? And so I got up off my knees and I went to my, my Bible and I'm reading my Bible, studying it and so forth. About 15 minutes later, my wife comes in the door in my office. And she says, have you thought about going back into pastorate? I mean, just like that. The same thing that was said to me in prayer. I said, where did you get that from? She goes, I was praying and God told me that. So I'm just asking you, have you thought about it? You know what I did? Immediately I picked up the phone and I called our, our director of the ministry and I said, God has called me back into pastoring. I am resigning today. Yeah. Hmm? That fast. Hmm? You want to know who made that situation? God. Wasn't Brother Mike. Look at it. If it was up to me, I would have never come down to Phoenix at all, ever. <laughs> Are you crazy? Amen. I'm, a, I'm a cold weather person. I'm from the north. So far north that I have little elves helping building toys. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you guys are like, really? You believe in that? <laughs> uh, I'm so far north. And I lived in Chicago, okay? In the winter. The first year we were there, it was minus 85 wind chill factor. The temperature was like 40 degrees without the wind. When the wind came, it was 85 below. My, the fluid in my eyes froze. The antifreeze in my engine, in my radiator, froze. Wait, I had all the proper radiator fluid, all the antifreeze, but antifreeze isn't good after it's 40 below. It turned to slushy. Opened up the radiator, all I see is his ice. Had to take it home and set it, set it until the spring, my car, so it could unthaw. Hmm? Driving down the road and it just died on me, just conked out. That's the weather I'm used to. You know, the snow blowing sideways, splitting the, the flesh on your face because it's like razors. I come down here and the sun beats me to death, cooked my brain. I got about three cells left. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Amen. But why are you here? Because God made me. Not He didn't make me come down here. He made me. Huh? Yeah, I am a mountain person. A past church I pastored up in Washington was in the mountains. I was used to mountain men. Huh? I mean, we're talking like everybody goes hunting. <laughs> Huh? I didn't have to go hunting because they'd all bring me in the town. They'd bring me the food. They'd go out and kill a bear and they'd bring me portion of it. Kill an elk, I got portion of it. Give the preacher's got to be taken care of. We got to take care of the preacher. <laughs> they, they didn't even come to our church. I'd go to the church and here's a, a bag or a package of meat. I got to taste every kind of wild game you can think of. I was eating it. You said, did you reject any of it? No. First of all, I didn't want to offend them. Number two is I like wild game. <laughs> huh? Amen. That's what I'm used to. And I, had, I could have a rapport with them. Yeah, I come down here, man. And I'm just telling you, everybody's got a big brain like mine. <laughs> we all, we all, yeah, yeah. 
You guys want to give me cactus jelly. I don't want cactus jelly. Give me a bear or an elk. He's <laughs> a <No>, cactus jelly. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. Oh, I'd take it if you gave it to me. <laughs> Amen. But this is where God put me. I had preachers going, do you like, you really like the heat? I said, no. They said, why are you going to Phoenix then? I said, well, I just figured Phoenix was hot all the time. Well, I found out it wasn't first year. Uh, I thought it was hot all the time. It's just summers that are bad here. I mean, for you guys, you like it. And I mean, you're used to it, so it's not bad. But to someone who's from the north, this is bad. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like you're standing on the edge of hell. <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't group you up like that. <laughs> Amen. Second Timothy chapter 2. How, what are you talking about? God, God puts you in places. He makes, he makes your way. He makes your ministry. He puts you where he wants you to reach people. Whether you like it or not. Huh? You know what? I don't think John, the revelator, was happy to be cast into a vat of oil. I don't think he was happy that he was banned to Patmos. Maybe that's what God did. He banned me to Phoenix. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 12. But we can just have a good time on this. It says, if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Look at that. God making a way. Isn't that funny? If we suffer, we'll reign with him. Doesn't mean you suffer, you're going to be saved. Suffer, you'll reign with him. Because, see, you've got to understand, we got the millennial reign coming up. Remember what God says to those who come before him? He's going to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You, he, t he tells him, he says, you are faithful over little, I'll make you ruler over much. Look at, God's only asking you to be faithful over the little he gives you. Be faithful over that, he'll make you a ruler. He says, Suff suffering is, is a minor thing compared to what Christ has faced. Jesus Christ was crucified. No, before he was put on the cross, he was mocked. As if he was king of the Jews. They mocked him. They beat him with an iron raid in his face, on his head. They pounded on the crown of thorns on his head. Hey, they put him in a robe. After they beat him beyond recognition, blood just gushing out everywhere. Hey, they, they mocked him, bowed down, put on that robe. Then they stripped him naked and walked him up to... Look at, do you understand? He doesn't have a little loincloth on. And it wasn't just a little bit of blood coming down his brow and a little bit out of his side. He was profusely bleeding. The Bible says he's beyond recognition. And we suffer a little for his sake and we cry and we want to quit. And he says, I'm trying to make you a ruler. Hmm? This suffer for him. There's different degrees of suffering. If we deny him, he also will deny us. He'll never give you a position of reigning. And that ruling and reigning is going to be in the millennium. See, after tribulation comes the millennium. And any believer who had suffered for Christ will be a ruler. Can you imagine those who got killed for the cause of Christ. I know John Casillas and his wife were killed down in Mexico by the cartel yeah. preaching the gospel. They didn't like it. Taking away their drug users. They're losing money. So what they do? They kill the preacher and his wife instead. Uh, they were friends of ours. They came here. They preached from this pulpit. Huh? You know what? God's going to have a great reward for them. They're going to reign with him. <laughs> they're going to be at the rule where he tells them to rule. By the way, they're going to be glad to rule where he tells them to rule. They're not going to say, well, I don't like this place. I want something else. It's not going to be Hillary Clinton. I want to be president. <laughs> huh? Now, they're going to be glad where they put it. he puts them. Look over in 1 Timothy. Did I say 2 Timothy already? Have we read that? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. I got, I got two more passages. 1 Timothy 1, 12. 
God makes you. He maketh thee to different from another. By the way, when he gives you a place to reign, when he gives you a rulership, you're going to all different, rule differently. Different places of rulers, different people you're going to rule over, and so forth. And here in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, for, for Lord who hath enabled me. Look who enabled him. For that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Look at it. They tell you not to be an enabler in this world, did they not? God says, yeah, I, I enable you. Want to know why? Because it's all on him. He's the one doing the making. I know I can't make you. If I enable you, I can't make you uh, into something that I want you to be. I really can't. I can lead you to the truth, but I can't make you think. So you got your own mind. you got your own heart. you got your own will. Look at it. But God can enable you. That's what he said right here. Uh, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was, He put me in the ministry. I didn't put myself in the ministry. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor. You see what Paul says I was? He's talking about himself. I was a blasphemer and a persecutor. He says an injurious. Now, he went and killed Christians. He beat them. He put them in prison. But I have obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Look, at that's what made Paul was God and his grace, his love, his mercy. Now look at this. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Oh, who I am chief. Am I a chief sinner? That's what he's saying. Hmm? God's changed me. Made you different. I was talking to a lady today about that. I said, let me tell you something. I said, I don't understand. And I mentioned this Sunday, I think it was. I don't understand. A person said they got saved. They got the Holy Ghost living in them, which is one-third of the Trinity, which is God the Spirit. God's got that power to create, that power to overcome, that power to give victory, all power in heaven and earth. And people say they got saved, but they don't change. How can you be flesh and have that kind of power, that creative power of God who made everything you see and not change? When I got saved, immediately I knew something happened and I felt that I had been, been all the power, all the power of sin had been lifted off of me. I knew something was different and I changed. And I told her I went from a very wicked life to the life I live today. Would have never known I had 10 kids, 10 grandkids, huh? one faithful wife, hmm? houses, properties, and stuff that God has blessed us with, hmm? the vehicles, you just keep on going, what God's done. I would have thought I would have been dead. I really thought I was going to be dead before 30 because of the way I was living my life. I was expecting it to be that short. Hmm. But God says, I'll make you. I'll make you. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. When you got saved, that old things are going away. The new things are coming on. By the way, you're going to be uh, sanctified. Okay. Sanctification is a process in your life. You got saved. You got rid of the sin. The blood has been applied to you. All your sins have been washed away. But now you've got problems because you've got addictions. <laughs> You're addicted to things you look at, addicted to things you hear, addicted to things you taste, put in your mouth, they're addicted to things you touch. And now you've got to be cleaned. Hmm? It's like going and buying a dish at a yard sale. And what do you do? Immediately you put it in the cupboard and you start eating out of it, right? No, you don't. You take it home and you wash it. You say, man, I don't know what they were using this for. <laughs> you wash it just like clothes. I tell my kids, you buy clothes out of yard sale, wash them. I don't care if they tell you they got, they've been cleaned. They've got tags of cleaner tags on them. I don't care. <laughs> I said, wash it. You don't know. And that's what God says. Hey, you got the cleaner tag on you now, but you need to be washed. Or in, from the north, washed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, washed in the blood, amen. I come from Washington. Yeah. 
I'm just telling you. And you may, you'll be made clean, and God will clean you up. He says you'll be transformed, huh, by the renewing of your mind. How's that done? By the Word, the Word of God. That's why you've got to be in the Word so God can make you what He wants you to be. It isn't just going to happen. Someone who gets saved never reads the Word, never prays, doesn't get under the preaching, doesn't get into the worship of the Lord. Guess what? They're going to be the same. I don't know why they'd want to do that. I'd want to be different. When I got saved, I wanted to be different. People thought I was nuts. They told me I was on a religious trip. That was a big thing to say back in the day I got saved. You're on some kind of religious trip. Because they thought everybody was out, zoned out on drugs on some religious trip. Huh? And when they found out I wouldn't do drugs anymore and I wouldn't drink anymore, and I wasn't selling anymore, huh? they called me up, what do you got? I told you, hello, Fred, Fred Walker. Hello? Yeah, this is Fred. He said, what do you got today? I said, I got something for you. He goes, really, what is it? I said, Jesus. You want to hear about him? Click. Fred, you there? <laughs> Last time I talked to Fred. <laughs> huh? I, I kicked myself because I should have said, come on over, I'll show it to you. But I didn't. And I was in it, and I guess God just wanted it that way. Hmm? And look at the last verse, Titus, chapter 3. Titus was a powerful preacher. He was a powerful preacher. Paul could depend on him. Paul would ha have him go, because Timothy had some, he was kind of timid and easily intimidated at times. So he'd send Titus, pick up the slack. Titus would come in there, and he, look, and the people today, they talk about, you know, these pharisaical Christians who don't want you to say what the truth is. And they think you're being mean or rude. And they say, well, John the Baptist wouldn't be allowed in your church. John the Baptist wouldn't be allowed to talk to you. Because you would say, you're rude. Huh? You're an unloving. John the Baptist says, you white and sepulchers. Jesus says, you white and sepulchers. John the Baptist says, go and repent. Find some meat for repentance. Go away from me. <laughs> Did he not say that? Huh? Now you're not loving. No, he's telling the truth. He knew what their wickedness was in their hearts. Hmm? Titus would go in there and preach, and they couldn't handle Titus. Titus would come in and say, I'm not listening to your junk. That's in the Greek. <laughs> I'm not listening to that. He, I'll tell you what the Bible says. Huh? What did Jesus say? And they try to intimidate him. Say, no, you're not intimidating me. You may be able to intimidate Timothy, but you're not intimidating me. That's why Paul sent me. Hmm? And they backed down. You want to know what they said to Samuel when he'd come into town? This was, this was uh, David's father. Did you come to Judges? Well, I came to worship with you. You want to know why he said that? Because Samuel come in and he'd say, Thus saith the Lord, you're all dead men. <laughs> You're all in trouble! Can you imagine them saying, You're mean every time you come into town. You know what? It wouldn't matter because God would kill them. Huh? You know what? We got weak Christianity today. That's why I said soft minds, weak doctrines. They can't handle it. Can't handle it. I say one thing and they say I'm rude. I called, I called two women because they were parroting some preachers that were wrong. And I said, oh, you guys are parrots. So I get in trouble for it. That's all I said. You're, just, you're parrots. Well, you know, parrots are cute. They're nice. You can put them on your finger. You put them up on your shoulder. I mean, you feed them seed. The only problem is, is they only know what they've been told. <laughs> hmm? So they got mad. You're being rude. No, I was being kind. If you want me to be rude, I can be rude. Yeah. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. By the way, I, I, I'm to the point, and I, and I told you I'm getting too old to back down or anything like that. I'm going to just finish this thing out. I'm not going to be one of these compromising preachers. Uh, I'm just not. Huh? If you don't like it, then go find some preacher that will kiss your little feet and give you a little ring on your finger and kiss it for you, and make you feel good and fill you, fill you with marshmallows. 
Titus chapter 3, verse 3. I'm just going to tell you the truth. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish. Whoa, being honest about himself, right? <laughs> Disobedient, deceived. People don't say this about themselves today. They don't want to be this way. They don't want people to know. I want you to know I was so wicked. You know what I tell people? I was wicked. And I hated it. I didn't like myself. I wouldn't like me today if I was, if I was around <laughs> in that manner. I tell you, I tell people, keep, keep your eye on that guy. <laughs> that guy, I got, I got, he's permeating with wickedness. Now, there are devils coming off this guy. I tell people, I, used to, I believed I was devil possessed before I got saved. Hmm? Asked my wife, I just flew off that. I got so angry some, sometimes, so mean, throwing people off my porch, kicking people out of my house. Hmm. I know I had a friend who was like that. He was devil possessed. He ended up killing himself, too. Hmm? Disobedient and deceived. I'm not going to lie to you what I was. But I'll tell you, Paul never lied about what he was. He said he was a blasphemer. But you know what? I'm just like him. I did it all in ignorance. I had no idea. I had no idea. I didn't know Christianity was what it was. I thought Christians were just people who liked going to church. <laughs> That's it. I didn't know there was a difference in them. It wasn't until Christ came and lived in me that I found out there was a difference in a Christian. I just thought there was another person just going to church, just trying to be do-gooders. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice, envy, hateful, and hating one another. See the lost person? That's the lost person. And the lost are saying Christians are haters. When it's they who are haters... See, they isolate the Jews, the Christians, the, the heterosexuals, the family, the proper family, core family. They hate that. But we're the haters because we don't accept them in the way they are. I don't accept it. I don't accept their sin. I don't accept sodomy. I don't accept lesbians. I don't accept the LGBTQ, RST, UV, w, X, Y, Z. I don't accept any of that. Hmm? Now, am I going to uh, witness to them? Yeah, I'll tell them about Christ. I'll hand them a track. I'll probably get hit for it because that's how they are, most of them. But there are some that will listen. They may rail on me and then venom come off their tongue and the hatred will be proven. But they'll say, I'm a hater. And they're the ones that will spew venom. And all I'm trying to do is get true to them so I can spare, help spare their life from hell. But that's hatred in their eyes. Verse 4 says, But after that, the kindness of lo and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Amen. We're all, this, we're all this evil. And all of a sudden, God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we have done. That means you can't save yourself. Yeah. Huh? But according to His mercy, He saved us. Amen. It's all God. 100% God, if you got any part of you that is going to save you, maybe you go to church, baptism, doing good, don't cuss, don't drink, don't smoke, don't do drugs, and you think that's part of getting saved, you're lost. That's all there is to it. Because you're saying that is equal to our Savior Jesus Christ. And that is what's going to help get you in. I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to boast. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourself is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If there's any works that can get you in, you have the right to boast. We might as well set up a throne next to Jesus Christ and a place for you so that you can be honored, worshipped, and glorified. Oh, you're so rude, preacher. That's how serious it is. Truth doesn't change. It never changed. I've been preaching this for 40 years. I remember preaching the ambitions like this. And people get all excited. They jump out of the seat. They cry. And they come down and get saved. What we have today is a bunch of Christians sitting there going. Uh, uh, can you stir me? <laughs> I'll stir you. I'm going to turn up the heat. And I hope I'm not going to stir you. And I hope you burn to the bottom. <laughs> 
Now you're being rude. Good. Because you won't stir. Stir in Jesus Christ. Amen. Be excited about this thing. I said this on our site. I said, life. We only have one shot at it. That's it. You might as well get, let God stir you up. Hey, be something. Go out on fire. Be like the challenger. <laughs> you guys don't even know what I'm talking about. Space shuttle challenger. It went out on fire, amen. Seven people died. <laughs> hmm. But it went out on fire. Why don't, we be, why don't we take that example and go out of this life on fire for Christ? One guy said, burn out for Jesus Christ. Amen. You wonder why I'm still here. Titus 3, verse 5 still. It says, not my works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That Holy Ghost came in and washed you clean. Huh? Your soul has been circumcised, separated from the flesh. Amen. Now it can't sin. Amen. Your flesh still does, though. That's why Paul says, it's not I that sin, but flesh, that sin that dwelleth in me. Because that sin's in the flesh. Doesn't mean you're not a sinner. Just means it's not your soul that sin. That soul's saved. It's, it's sanctified. It's set aside. It is justified. Going to be with Jesus. That old flesh you look in the mirror every day on, you know you think you're handsome, guys? You guys are fooled. You must be blinded by the God of this world to think you're handsome. But, <laughs> and you girls who think that, you know, you, I saw a lady, she cut my hair. How, how do you like it? She cut my hair the other day. And I'm, she's got to be 57, 60 years old. She looks like she's trying to be 16. The clothes, the makeup. She's got sleeves on either arm, tattoos down her legs. She's got piercings all over her body. And I'm sitting there going, does she not know what she looks like with that? You know, she got a big old eagle on her arm. And when her flesh sags, it's going to look like a, like a vulture. <laughs> huh? I'm just telling you. Do, you. do you understand that old body you have? That you mark up, that you primp and prep, is not what God has saved. Amen. Why don't you take care of the soul? Why don't you spend more time reading your Bible and praying than being in front of the mirror and taking care of the flesh? My preacher used to say, if a man's in front of the mirror longer than 30 seconds, he's in front of the mirror too long. No, me and me and brother Dave, we we can we can go less than thirty seconds. We just buff our head off and we're gone. <laughs> That's it. There, there's no no. Look, when I was younger, I had long hair and I had I had hair on top of my head. Don't if you believe it or not. But I had hair and I used to part it down the middle, comb it straight back, pour it back here sometimes on a ponytail. Had it behind my ear. I spent a whole lot of time prepping my hair. I used to use blow dryers. <laughs> I didn't go to a barber. I went to a beauty shop. <laughs> I, after I got saved, the beauty shop was out the window. <laughs> I'm going to a barber. Hmm? <laughs> beauty shop for a man. <laughs> these guys get these pedicures and facials and manicures and all this stuff. What are you? You know what you need to do? I'll give you a pick and a shelly and go out there and dig a trench. Break your fingernails and get calluses on your hands and blisters. Uh, act like a man. Amen. That's the kind of man you're supposed to. That's what God wants to make you into. That's why our country's in a mess it is with fathers and men in the home. We got a bunch of, a bunch of guys acting like girls. They said, no wonder the guys dress up like mama. Because mama rules the home. Then when they go to church, they go to the Catholic church. Okay, I'm going to hurt somebody here. Catholic church, and, and the guy behind the, the desk 
Huh? He dresses like mama. He's got a long old skirt on and robe. Huh? You know what I'm dressing? Like this. I'm going to smell like sweat. And if you don't like it, too bad. Look, I can't stand it myself. I go, go shower and go, oh. 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 But I know I've been working. Hmm? That's what I liked about Brother Bloxon. Brother Bloxon, even up until the age of 77, and he ended up in a wheelchair. He was a mechanic. He always dressed in his mechanic clothes every day just in case he had to do work for somebody on their car, even in his wheelchair. He was ready to go to work. Because guys, these, these Pima Indians would come from everywhere and ask him to work on his car and do mechanic work. And he said, I smell like sweat every day. Amen. Hmm? When he went to be with the Lord, man, every Pima Indian I think ever, that ever uh, knew him came out. Hmm. You want to know what kind of man he was? He led this one guy to the Lord. He was looking for him. He said, I'm looking for you. I want to find you. And so he goes. They said, where is this man? He said, he was just arrested. He's going to go to jail. Looks like he's going to go for a long time. He killed a man. So he went over to the, the jail, and he found him, started talking to him, found out he murdered a man. Talked to the guy. He got saved. The guy goes to prison, spends time in prison, gets out, Surrenders to preach. Now he's pastoring. I know two preachers today that are pastoring that killed men. Went to, went to prison for it. Hmm? You know what? When they tell their testimony, I can guarantee the congregation isn't moving. <laughs> I'm not moving, man. I don't want to be a second victim. <laughs> now, he ain't going to kill you. He got saved. Huh? God made him different. Who made you? Who made you what you are today? Verse 6 says, Which he shed on, his, on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. The Holy Ghost. He shed it on abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Jesus Christ is the reason we got the Holy Ghost. That being justified by his grace. There we are, justification. We should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're, we're heirs. That means we're co-inheritors. We're justified. What's that mean? Just as if you never sin, God looks at you. You never sin. Oh, why? Because of the blood of Christ. You're perfect. When He sees you, He sees Christ. Hmm? And He doesn't have anything against His Son. He He could look at He could have all kinds of books and look for Jesus' name and His sins, and He's not going to find any. Because the Bible says He was tempted as we were, but without sin. So when He looks at you, all He sees is a person who never sinned. Why? It's been washed away by the blood of the Lamb because you received Jesus Christ. You believed God. You believed God. When he said, I sent my son to die for you, and all you had to do is receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you believed him and you trusted Jesus Christ, and God says, justified. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hmm? And you don't lose it. Amen. It's eternal life, not temporal life. Eternal life. Hmm? You know what these people like to do? These people think you lose your salvation. They say God will never leave us nor forsake us except if you sin. <laughs> Wait a minute, that's not what the Bible says. Hmm? They say they're all twisted up. They're all messed up. I'm telling you, God makes you the justified believer. God makes you saved. You can't do it on your own. All these things I just mentioned tonight, he made you. Our Heavenly Father, help us understand what we heard. You get glory through it all. Yeah. We want to give you the praise, God. Thank you for making us who we are. Right. Oh, we're not perfect. But we sure are different than we were when we first got saved. And prior to being saved, as you told us, Lord, that we're haters, and we're hateful and envious, filled with malice, living in malice. Lord, we were living for this world in pleasures and deceived to serving our diverse lusts, different lusts that we had for different things. We were disobedient and fools, and yet you changed us into what we are today. Many of us are 180% different. Thank you, thank you, thank you for giving us a way out.
You hit their bowed several of you. Bring it.